you're watching a decentered media talk with me rob watson conversations about community media visit decentered.co.uk or follow on instagram and twitter at decentered media hello rob watson here and this is another uh, decentered media talk and this is the sixth talk in the series an introduction to community media and what i'm going to talk about today uh, in in this session is kind of start to think about what we mean by community um because community is a very open term and there's lots of definitions for community there's a kind of technical definition for it there's a administrative definition for community there's a, a community is used in a way which is kind of just very open by people but there's a lived experience uh, definition for what we mean by community as well so what i want to try and do is is just start the piecing some of these things together some of these elements into a, a more coherent kind of framework of what we think community is and how we think community operates this is the starting point of a conversation rather than a definitive answer and there's probably a lot more that we can uh, discuss and engage in and read about so this is just a kind of way of getting that process going as ever uh, there'll be a set of notes which are available uh, with the uh, slides as well so any links any uh, references that they're, they're, they're kind of uh, uh, included in the notes um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully won't speak as long as I spoke in in previous <laughs> sessions, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll we'll kind of uh, look at this as an approach to thinking about what we mean by community. I think one of the the things that always strikes me is when you talk to people and they say they use the phrase community. Oh, we're doing this for the community, or you know this this that we're addressing the needs of the community. It's kind of it's such a, an open and broad term. And then when you actually start to say to people, well, what do you mean by that? Who who are you specifically addressing? And I think one of the things we can kind of make it make our lives easier in a way is to say we are talking about people. Uh, communities are a useful kind of uh, container for groups of people who interact in different ways and if we narrow it down and hopefully i'll try and explore this through this uh, presentation if we narrow that down into a sense of well this is our community this is the community we're seeking to address then we are addressing specific people so it's not so broad and it's not so open um and and usually what happens as well is if you you know kind of people shy away from defining what we mean by community but there's a simple answer to that uh, go and talk to people and get a sense of what people think of as their community or the options that are available in different uh, types of communities and and really respond to people because if we don't know the answer talk to people they will tell us what their definition of community is and how we think it should be used and developed and, and integrated in the work that we do um so let's hope um this makes sense and as i say the notes will be available so i'm going to now share the screen <coughs> and the powerpoint slides um so we've now got um so yes yeah, session six um and let's see if we can turn the screen there we go so you know uh, what is community i mean that's a, a very open-ended question and i don't think we'll come up with an answer uh quite so easily as you know just just being able to launch into a particular definition but there you know lots of people have thought about this and have indicated what their um ideas that underpin uh, a sense of public engagement might be and what is the difference between public engagement audience engagement community engagement these things are really important to tie down so uh, uh, one definition of community is a group of people with diverse characteristics who are linked by social ties uh, and who share a common perspective and engage in joint action in geographical locations or settings there's a lot in that it kind of suggests that we 
can identify, if you like, what a community is by its characteristics, by its facts. Uh, and it's something which we can kind of almost label or tick off and that we just need to look for a place or that we need to look for a, a setting, uh, a location, and that we need to look at people's uh, social char characteristics, their demographic characteristics is often the way that this is described, uh, and and thereby we will come up with a set of answers as to what a community is. Um, but there's a there's another way to look at this in terms of uh, those social units and what are, what are those ties that are shared in common, and that can be a set of values, uh, an approach, and something which informs people of different characteristics. Uh, so these people might participate and come together in a particular location or a particular place, but they might be motivated in different ways to come together, which do, isn't readily identified by their externalized characteristics. Um, and so, you know, what is it that bonds people? So an important part of thinking about uh, community is the idea of uh, uh, bonding uh, and mutual engagement and trust and a sense of belonging and those kind of issues, uh, which is something that we'll explore uh, as as we keep moving forward. So there's uh, uh, you know durable relations as something that we can, that connects us and these maybe go beyond our immediate geographical ties and maybe be, go beyond our social characteristics so that we kind of become what might be known as a community of interest or a community of practice. And this kind of comes down into uh, a kind of difference between, if you like, there's two, two ways that we can look at this. We can look at the facts, incredibly important, it's one side of what we do, or we can look at the processes. So how, how do those, the dynamics of a community interact with one another and what motivates and informs that and we've got to do both we've got to look at both in order to be able to get a, a wider fuller sense of what a set what community might be about uh, ofcom uh, as we've discussed previously has a definition of community which perhaps needs to be updated and needs to be tested a bit more uh, but it's something which they are informed by uh, previous work and previous um, uh, policy development to identify what would define a community radio station. And as we've identified previously, community radio stations provide a voice for, commu for local communities across the UK. And there's a very specific, uh, clear remit to deal with local, uh, something which is of a, of, of a short geographic space, a confined, not confined, a, a localized geographic space. Usually a, a community radio broadcast license uh, has a five kilometer uh, uh, circumference, uh, not circumference, um, a diameter. So that it kind of, it, it it's not reaching out to a region, but it's certainly reaching out and servicing a town uh, or, 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 or part of a city. And then, the kind of community work that's undertaken for a community radio station is volunteer led. Uh, and there, there are very few people who are paid to, to do this. And in, in, in bringing volunteers together, you're, rep you're, you're, you're representing a, a diverse collection, a diverse mix uh, of cultures and interests. And this provides a rich, um, set, a, a rich set of programs and content. Uh, because people are coming at this from different, uh, different, different uh, backgrounds, from different experiences, from different uh, points in the social spectrum, uh, for, with with different cap capabilities. So, community radio, in this definition, community is identified as something which is quite open. But that community doesn't have to be open. It can serve. It can also serve a specific interest group uh, or a specific for example faith group or a specific uh, ethnic group uh, and or cultural group and these things are kind of in interrelated with each other but the main thing is that the the radius of up to five kilometers and they're running a not-for-profit basis so the motivations for running a community radio station are defined within that kind of civic engagement civic uh, structure uh, mutual aid, uh, the social uh, economy, 
and the so and the civic um networks of charities voluntary aid groups uh, mutual aid groups um and and informal community groups uh, and they can be then they can have the flexibility then and the openness to be defined by whether it's a particular area that is uh, uh, the identification factor so you know you you're serving a particular geographically based community or a particular interest so your age group or your uh, gender group or your sexuality group whichever is uh, 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 the hook if you like for a particular community to come together and and uh, interact with this media uh, so you can then open this up to minority tastes in terms of music uh, and terms of content and arts and things like that so that you uh, you you're maybe not <clears throat> stuff that isn't generally played out through mainstream and corporate media can be find a home in community media groups so in this end in this sense it's, it's minority community interests whether it's minority culture minority expressions of identity minority expressions of location and belonging that the the general mainstream would not um fit with and that also brings the benefit of uh, including training and community news and discussion as part of the process of developing this. I think putting this into context, there's a lot of concern and worry about the nature of our modern society. As we become increasingly globalized, we've become increasingly uh, separated from a strong sense of rooted belonging you know it's almost as if our social media or you know corporate globalized media has an expectation that we can kind of float around the world and we can we you know it's kind of we just it's very attractive digital nomad kind of model of uh, uh, being and living, uh, but the vast majority of people actually want to identify with a place where they belong and they have roots and they can uh, start families and they can, you know, progress in their lives and they can. And and Robert Putman is a very famous uh, commentator on this, and he described in his uh, kind of seminal book, Bowling Alone, how we witnessed in the second half of the 20th century with the arrival of television and mass communications a kind of uh devaluation of the sense the, the feeling of community and that what we are living in is an age which is uh, without deep roots and that doesn't easily bring people together now there's lots of uh things that we can talk about and think about in the way that that is actually structured because a, a counter argument might be, might be that social media actually encourages connection and encourages people to uh, uh to cross boundaries um so it's 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 not an open-ended discussion there's a, a, a you know at some point there's a kind of choice to be made about where, which which form and which model of community is appropriate for the age that we live in there's a short video uh, that I think kind of illustrates this quite well. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, I just realized I didn't set that to um, to uh, optimize. For Is the, the glue that holds society together coming unstuck? And if so, who or what's to blame? Robert Putnam, a political scientist from the United States, published his book, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community in 2000. 
In this influential work, the Harvard professor argued that what he called social capital, the connections that grease the wheels of our society, were breaking down, taking with them networks, trust, and reciprocity that these connections advance. Putnam drew together figures that highlighted falling civic engagement. Everything from parents volunteering at their children's school, to church going, to dinner parties, to citizens taking part in local government. And chose a very striking symbol to highlight what he meant. The sharp decline in neighborhood 10-pin bowling leagues, he said, had led to many more people bowling alone. Putnam explains his concept of social capital by saying it depends on people saying, I'll do this for you, without expecting anything specific back from you, in the confident expectation that someone else will do something for me down the road. He sees the culprits as pressure on time and money, the disintegration of the family unit, media, television, and finally generational change. And he is worried. Putnam contends that social capital helps drive productivity, health, education, safety, and the economy. He argues that we must start reconnecting. To better understand Putnam's thinking, consider this. Remember when kids regularly kicked a football about together on a patch of grass in front of their homes? They all became friends. The parents chatted to their neighbors as they watched them play and watched out for the other children. Neighbors did favors for each other. They took part in group activities. They shared things. Social capital was in evidence and wider community bonds were built. Fast forward 30 years and where are the kids now? The patch of grass is empty. There's no one in sight. The kids are all still playing football, but alone, in their bedrooms, on their computers. They're avid participants. They're all involved, just not together. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that brings us um, into a kind of the, the, the key word in this uh, discussion is social capital and the idea that uh, communities are defined or are uh, we can trace the uh, the extent to which a community is functional through the level of social capital that is experienced by people in a community. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the factors that uh, play through uh, and reduce this social capital, which is of an interactive nature uh, and a mutual nature, uh, you know, there's, there's Yes, we can talk about media, but there's things like motor cars uh, and the the uh, the kind of fear of strangers, and there's a whole load of uh, kind of f uh, uh, issues that define this uh, this rejection of mutual social interaction, and thereby reducing social capital. So it's you know it it it's not straightforward, and I don't think Putnam was arguing that it would it should be seen in a a simplistic way but it's a dynamic thing and i think it's important for us to kind of look at and and when we define things like poverty particularly here in the uk as to what do we mean by that and po poverty in the uk is concentrated specifically but not exclusively to uh, urban centers former uh, coastal resort towns things like that former industrial uh, areas um where where what was previously a strong economic base has declined uh, and in the response to the pandemic uh, the the this is kind of repeat you know we, we've seen evidence and the joseph roundtree foundation points to this that those people who are adrift in a world of poverty also uh, are adrift and more susceptible to the negative impacts of covid um, so the the public health benefit of having a, a reduced levels of co of poverty are uh, it's it's arguable uh, benefit everybody regardless of where you are but one of the things that you can also map um and, and this gets done uh, uh, on on a uh, it's not a cause and effect link i would say um but the idea that the 
high income areas are also areas with high levels of social capital. And what do we mean by social capital? Well, it's uh, uh, issues such as the connections that you have, um, the circles, the social circles that you move within, uh, the level of access to cultural opportunities, if you like, uh, the way in which we um, have a repertoire of expectations about uh, what it is that we can discuss as a community uh, and what is relevant to us. Uh, is that open and outward looking or is that uh, inward looking? And that can't necessarily be defined by uh, a geographic location, although it, there is some correspondence with that, but it also can't be uh, identified with, with uh, wealth because where does social capital get generated? But, you know, you can have strong social bonds, you know, the myth of the working class community uh, that has strong social bonds and a so strong so sense of social identity and a, and a culture of its own. And this was one of the things that, you know, uh, was the, was decimated in the process of deindustrialization that was forced through in the 1980s. Uh, was that you also lost the, the working class culture that went with that um, and, and you reduced social capital on that basis. So people were cut adrift from the institutions, the local in mutual institutions that had previously uh, given that community some sense of identity and strength. Uh, so partly this is an economic issue, partly this is a geographic issue, partly this is a symbolic issue as well, uh, is that, you know, kind of the, the, the models of social capital that are, uh, that can be mapped out can also be placed, if you like, within a hierarchy. And what we've seen in community development processes is, is often a sense that, um, you just need to come in as managers and put in the things like build roads and uh, subsidize industrial units and, and therefore you will get a strong economy comes out of that and therefore you will get a strong sense of identity and that doesn't seem to work. You know, it's like the when a city, the example here in Leicester about the what many cities have tried to do this, some more successfully than others, calling an area a cultural quarter as if that alone will bring creative industries dynamic uh industries into play in a in an area uh in a, in a, you know in in a, in a neighborhood within a part of a city that is formally disused and it's kind of you know uh, uh there's there's an interesting dynamic with a place like liverpool where that kind of you know what you get is you get the early adopters the creative communities move into low cost housing and low cost rent you know uh, uh, industrial units and uh, um you know, cheap, cheap accommodation to do their work. And then a process, what we'll look at in a bit of gentrification takes over and then they, the rents go up and they get pushed out, pushed out. So they're high in social capital, um, but they're low in economic and political capital. And so it's a dynamic process with things, you know, it, and it's not, um, social capital is not uh, new, it's not neutral. Uh, people make decisions and policymakers uh, define how social capital is going to be accrued and played out. But the other factor that comes into this is the underpinning with the idea of community volunteering. And, um, you know, this was the, uh, the big push that the Cameron led coalition government made in uh, 2010 for the big society, which if you like, was a, a, a some would say was a was a cover for the austerity cuts that came in, uh, but one of the things that's you know, subsequent, you know, we could run our library services purely with volunteers. Uh, we can run social services with volunteers. We can, you know, we we can rely on the civic sector, the mutual aid sector, to fill the gaps that were being pulled back from by the state. Uh, but what? you know, kind of has subsequently been learned and which I think didn't take uh, much, um, uh, much, much, much time to, to get a, gra a, a, a grip of and to, co to come to a view about this is that, you know, volunteering is difficult to organize. You know, it's kind of, it's uh, when, when you're working with volunteers, you're not working in an environment in which you can plan 
uh, strategically in the same way that you might do if you're working in a corporate organization where everybody's paid. So commissioning services with volunteers in mind is incredibly difficult and, and liable to failure. So most organizations who are volunteer led or volunteer focused don't engage in the big uh, projects because it's just too difficult to provide a, a local authority or a commissioning health service, if you like, uh, the guarantees that it needs that the service is going to be de delivered and rolled out. And it's hard for volunteers to keep up with the pace of change. And the, the kind of managing the cash and the, the, the flow, the, the, the flow of resources uh, is, is also very difficult because you kind of working on the level that people are able to trust uh, what you are undertaking. And one of the problems with a lot of the funding um, models for, uh, you know, kind of that, uh, that are out there is that they, yes, they will, uh, they will support project needs, but they won't support core, core funding needs like a premises. So you can't get, you know, funding for you to, to pay your rent and, 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 uh, put the heating on and pay for the lights. Um, you can get a project to run a, a particular, uh, you can get funding to run a particular project about something heritage, uh, arts and creativity, a social well-being, whatever those projects are, but you've got to have a strong base from which to do that. And those costs are often not uh, covered. Plus managing volunteers is is costs money, you know, and, and people who volunteer, volunteer on the basis that they're getting something out of it, which doesn't feel like work, but feels like, you know, a contribution to a social uh, uh, project. And there, therefore, you've got to address people in different ways. So to be managerial about the way that you volunteer, manage volunteers it is counterproductive. And, you know, we say with community media that it travels at the speed of trust. And that includes the volunteers. The volunteers won't volunteer unless they get a sense of creative achievement out of this project, about the work that they do. And if it in any way feels like you're being managed in a you know a professional kind of way, performance indicators, safeguard and um training all of those kind of things measurable impacts then people lose interest and they give up and they they go off and do something else so you know it's 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 a tension and it's a paradox that um the danger is is that you think that you can run a volunteer a volunteer-led organization through professional management techniques and it that can be counterproductive and productive in itself so it kind of it indicates to us to to some extent that people come together for a, a motivated reason. Uh, and there are a number of these reasons which we think of as being relevant and important, a part of which is a kind of sense of shared identity and that we, we are coming together in order to uh, uh, communicate something or to share an experience uh, related to our identity, which is... Um, transferable i suppose uh, sometimes we fear we, we draw strength from being associated with people with a similar identity and sometimes we feel uh, we draw strength from being associated with people of different identities what we don't want to do is be kind of locked into our any kind of compartment with no op with no option or alternative to engage with other people in a way which is um separate and and maintained you know separately from from that you know reduces that level of social interaction and there's a lot of uh you know co creative organizations as always you know the famous uh, uh apple or pixar model where you know there's a very egalitarian appro approach to where the cafes and the toilets are placed because the 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 CEO and director uses the the same facilities as everybody else that works in the building um Whereas in some financial organisations, you know, uh, CEOs had private lifts that took them up to private suites of offices, and they never interacted with anybody else from their organisation. Uh, so there's there's a there's a kind of the danger is that you know kind of that separation from the social um, 
model and social experience, the public experience of life, uh, is a, a, a results in further uh, extreme forms of segregation and inequality. And we see a widening of inequality uh, in our society. Uh, so trying to think of a, 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 a model which would um, kind of social democratic expectations can be based on things like platforms and access. This is why access for community media is incredibly important. I always use the analogy of the tram and that, you know, uh, uh, you can encourage people to drive around a city using their cars. Um, and that's a private form of um, transport. And you can pay as much as you like for your car. You can have a top of the range luxury vehicle or you can have an old banger and you just run around you know in the streets but everybody's kind of atomized and 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 we have to build more car parks and we have to build more roads whereas the experience of people who uh, and communities and cities and places that have trams for example is a, a well uh, uh, funded open access uh, mass transit system using things like trams is that you get rich and poor old and young working uh, using these transport me uh, modes because they can get around quite uh, easily so that social democratic platform is put in place uh, and then you you're, so you're bringing people together in a convenient form of transportation uh, for social purposes and not as a private model of social transportation and i think that's a good analogy for the way that we can think about our media is that we you know, too often what we do is we segregate, certainly funding organizations and training organizations often do this. You have to work with a very narrow, specific group of people. And it's very difficult to get funding for a socially inclusive model of engagement. Whereas what you can do is you can get model uh, funding for specific um, uh, social groups. Sometimes that's really important uh, to redress the balance uh, of uh, say a lack of a history, a legacy of lack of representation uh, for creative purposes. But for me, I'd like to see that in a sense that the um, the, the integration is, is within an integrated social uh, model rather than segregated social models. Uh, and the principle of broadcasting is one that we you broadcast to all within a geographic location, not just to specific groups. Some people might not find it interesting, other people may find it interesting. And you kind of build up your your community uh, based on uh, engagement with everybody rather than uh, purely speaking to or facilitating support for very narrow groups of the population. And you know, that kind of there's 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 a push and pull with that, I think. And you know, we it, as 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 there are many benefits from that, there is also and affordances that come from that. There are also disadvantage. You know, you know, there's a disadvantage of pursuing a community model like that. So, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about. I, I would argue we're thinking about integration, integration and assimilation within a shared culture uh, as being our primary objective, and the idea of a community that doesn't have that aim for integration and assimilation. Um, and, and what I'm not saying, in, and what would be uh, a, a mistake to think about integration and assimilation as being uh, somehow a way of eradicating people's cultural traditions, heritages, and backgrounds. No, it's not about that. It's about developing a sense of mutual understanding so that we can integrate, we, we can interact with each other, and that we understand, we have a sense of understanding of the common. Uh, relationships and the fluidity and the mutual benefits that come from in, a, an integrated and assimilated model of community. Because if we're all just left to follow our own path and support people like ourselves or people with similar interests as ourselves, then we perpetuate inequality and we perpetuate uh, a, a social segregation. And I think this is, again, part of the a uh, crucial role of community media is to aim for and to offer a kind of a, a forward looking sense of identity, which takes those uh, pathways, those traditions, those threads of identity and brings them together into something new rather than merely 
um, and, and recognize the value and the history and the, the courage and the joy that comes from people's different cultural identities and cultural experiences, but has the uh, objective of push of, of offering that as uh, something that transcends that, which enables us to engage with one another for the future, not merely kind of being held by our former identities in the past, because society has to move forward. We have to, we can't just keep, you know, we can become overly nostalgic uh, about the former sense of, you know, the past sense of identities, but we've actively got to work and it is hard to do this. It's difficult. There are difficult conversations that need to be had where we bring people, you know, we help people to come forward, to move forward to something which is mutually supportive and of mutual social benefit for one another, rather than it just being of merely private interest. So, uh, underpinning community media then is a, a strong sense of community engagement um and this means taking into account our uh, corresponding similarities and differences um and that you know, i think one of the challenges at the moment is that there's an attempt in some say newspapers and some political thinking and it's prevalent on social media is this idea of kind of focusing on difference and justifying difference purely in its own terms and not looking at people as part of an integrated set of identities and with an integrated set of needs so we can highlight and um and and promote difference in some circumstances but it doesn't get us very far. It leaves us isolated. Whereas if we can incorporate our differences into a social model, which takes account of those differences, but allows something new and creative to emerge from that, then that is where I think the kind of the, the, uh, the benefits that we get from that kind of integrated model come, uh, are to be found. It's hard to do in practice um and and we have to be creative about it but one of the crucial things about community engagement is you can't do this from the top down you can't do this by deciding a policy and saying this is how it's going to work and aren't we all wonderful and amazing uh because we've got this policy it has to be built from the bottom up and there has to be support uh, for these new models of engagement. And I think our community media, because it's a broadcast for often a broadcast form of media, but not exclusively, if we look at community radio, for example, is something that has to be available to everybody. And every, you know, it, it's anybody can switch a radio on and if they've got one and listen to our community radio stations. Uh, yes, there's a, a build and block of support for the individuals and the groups that are part of uh, what makes up our community and what makes up our society. Um, but that shouldn't be something which uh, keeps people in segregated in those groups, but enables people, inspires people and helps and assists, assists people to, to, to play a role in the wider social uh, interactions uh, and to encourage participation. So, you know, community then is kind of defined in a number of different ways. <clears throat> do we define our own idea of community? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, do we, you know, can we can we say, yes, I'm part of this community or that community? Uh, it's very difficult to um, state and to um, kind of, you know, it's a, it actually it's a very interesting question to ask you know to how essential is your are the key characteristics of your identification as a member of a community with that community uh so what does it mean to be uh gay and part of the gay community if you don't identify with the gay groups or the disability community or the feminist community then, then does that mean to say that you're excluded from that? Do you have to find a way to perform your identification in order to be accepted? Um, 
and that's very interesting. So you, you've got the kind of the, the, the role of the individual, if you like, and the social group, uh, you know, you, th- there's that famous uh, expression, you know, joke, isn't it, from uh, Groucho Marx, I, or it might be Woody Allen. You know, I wouldn't want to be part of a club that wanted me uh, as a member. Uh, and it, it's, you know, you've got this dynamic because community life can be restrictive. Uh, and if you Id- if you don't identify with that community life, can you change it? How open is that to uh, uh, to kind of re-perform in a different way, to to engage with others in a different way, purely because you are you identify with something else? Um, which is your stronger motivating, um, informing characteristic? Uh, you know, we've not talked about, and I'll do this in later <clears throat> detail in a later talk, the uh, equalities um, framework and protected characteristics and things like that. But, you know, if you're, if you put your fandom of your local football club before your sense of identity as a gay man or a lesbian, or as somebody who is differently abled or somebody who is, you know, it's, it's, it's of a particular ethnic um uh, identity and and you know we we invest in our sense of community but we invest on in our sense of community sometimes and, and perhaps more often than we give it credit for because of the symbolic resonance that that has rather than because we meet certain characteristics and that kind of interplay is 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 not quite as clear as maybe we need we, you know when we write a form to fill out a funding application to meet a particular social need uh, that that's not quite so well i uh, expressed it's difficult uh, so this idea of what community means to people is a crucial factor uh, and it was interesting during the, the, the lockdown if, if we remember back to 2020 and leicester's extended lockdown and there was a lot of um consternation expressed from people who live in the outlying areas Bairstall, Glenfield, Braunston, Oadby, Wigston uh, because they were included in the extended lockdown because of the postcode geography and the numbers of of infections at the time which identified that these areas were hotspots and this is basically what's called the uh, urban area the, the Leicester urban area which is different from the city boundaries which is the uh, public administration area and yet from a health perspective people's you know it, it it had to be broadened than just being the city boundaries uh, to deal with the issues of uh, virus transmission in the city and then what you got was a a, a pushback uh, that was expressed in the media and through social media from people saying well we're not the same as those people in the city um, and that can be, you know, located along uh, 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 through a model of uh, ethnic identity. Uh, if you look at the demographics of Leicester and Leicestershire, I mean, quite literally, as you cross the city, the city boundary, ethnic uh, rates, ethnic population rates drop significantly from almost fifty percent of over fifty percent of the population in the city dropping down to less than two and a half percent in the county. So there's a there's a number of factors which sh- shape our experience, but also shape our sense of uh, community that we belong to um, and the, the kind of institutions that are set up and the models, you know, Leicester is a growing city and at some point it may, um, it may, um, uh incorporate these areas uh in in urban planning terms and i I believe that there there is some modeling about policy development that in order to produce a more integrated urban management experience that the city would have to be extended and 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 more widely grown but that needs the consent of the people and to have the consent of the people there has to be an identification with the place and the location and if that identification isn't there then it, it's difficult for people to make those kind of changes so what role does our media play in this well there's a strong arg- argument that some of our local media here in leicester plays a negative and um 
divisive role in uh, focusing on differences. Uh, and we don't have enough uh, engaged, integrated, forward-looking media to bring people together in, in, in a you know in a shared sense of identity and that's you know that's that's a challenge and i think that's where part of the um the 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 work that needs to be done is to be found uh so but you can you can shape people in different ways as well so communities of interest are of uh, of a, a, another way of looking at an idea of community location ethnicity uh religion faith those kind of things are, are one aspect but it could also be you know the sense of uh, you know the things that we participate in uh whether it's you know kind of gaming communities whether it's football whether it's classic cars whether it's model railways you know we we, we have interests and we form a sense of uh, identification with those interests which enables us to interact with other people and our hobbies and our passions and our interests bring us together uh whether it's our you know kind of our our, our uh, interest in a particular faith or religion, whether it's our interest or, or you know in particular type, types of food or music, it's something that we can participate in. And this idea of being part of a practice community, so people who attend or go to gigs and concerts, or who read books, or who like art, or you know uh, uh, like radio, I suppose, you know, it's kind of that tells us something about our interests. Uh, and and you know it's it's the key, it's one of the hooks if you like for reconstructing a sense of community a stronger sense of community which okay if our geographic community isn't so strong what has compensated for that breakdown in local communities and local neighbourhood based uh, uh, strong communities is a sense of communities of interest and communities of practice where we come together because we are passionate about you know fashion or passionate about uh sports or pa passionate about fitness you know, whatever those uh things might be heritage um and i suppose what putnam argues is that there's you know we we want to think about this idea of a a kind of sticky community what makes our community sticky that people want to be part of them that want to retain uh and and repeatedly um, uh, come back to uh, activities that bring people together, which enables them to um, get together and to share a common experience. And it's quite a good question to ask, you know, what makes something uh, a, a community activity what makes it sticky it's hard work to understand that and in my experience i'm not very good at identifying what those things are other people are much better than me uh, i have my interests uh, but they don't tend to be those interests that are shared by the vast majority of other people i'm not into football you know i have an interest in music but it's um it's kind of it's it's more of a private expression of that rather than it being a, a social expression and you know it it's how, how do we um how, how do we engage with people in order for something to become part of the routine of our community life uh that it it's something which happens you know continuously and that we have it builds into institutions and this is the issue about you know we can't force people together into a community we have to inspire and encourage people to be part of a community because otherwise you know community just can't be artificially created uh, it has to be spontaneous and grassroots and it has to be, has to be a mutual identification so in a way, what we're thinking about with communities is that it's a sense of possibilities. Uh, so if we're not defining our sense of community through geography, uh, then maybe we're identifying our sense of community through uh, interests, uh, through what is possible. And from that, we see an emergence of community. So it becomes a learning community. It becomes something which is about uh, mutual support and mutual interest uh, rather than it being something which is purely defined because of our social characteristics or our location is actually something which can go beyond that which is about you know those things that are possible that are a shared kind of sense of 
you know, it's 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 something that we can all uh, or many of us can participate in, rather than simply just um, participate in and contribute to. I think that's important to make that distinction because the audience model of uh, we've talked about this previously, but the audience model is something that you do to people, whereas the community is model is something where people come together to do something for themselves. I think that you know kind of is a is a crucial distinction, and we flip the social model around to focus on communities of possibility and the conditions of possibility, uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of communities which are artificially constructed by policy uh, uh, managers. Um, but that, you know, that our experience will define this and what are our our common and our shared social experiences. Well, for some people, it's homelessness. For some people, it's the it, the effect of poverty. For some people, it's the effect of racism. For some people, it's the effect of ageism. For some, you know, we you know, there's a list, uh, and and without acknowledging those common experiences. Uh, which are more common than we maybe give them credit for, and allowing people to share and air uh, the stories of their experience, then we don't come to a mutual settled view. And it's, you know, the I think uh, I've said this a, a number of times previously that, you know, with community media, it's really not about your opinions. You can use social media platforms to to express your opinions as much as you like it's about your experiences and if we are shared experience uh, because each of us are experts in our own experience nobody else is better positioned to talk through and to uh, explain and to describe our own individual experience uh, and uh, you surprisingly many many people will be uh We'll, we'll never have acknowledged, uh, uh, you know, growing up in poverty, for example. Um, and I, I, I didn't grow up in poverty, but I grew up in Liverpool in the 1970s and 80s, which was affected significantly by poverty. Um, and the, uh, uh, the experience is kind of written out of, you know, working class culture and life because you're aspirational you want to move on and this is the this is where it impacts with our politics our politics of aspiration need to be counterbalanced with our communities of experience where we can talk about and share our experience and that would then inform uh, um, any future policy development process because our experiences can be radically different our experiences can be very similar and they into you know they 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 allow us to uh, bring people together with from different backgrounds to talk about their shared experience and i think as a deliberative platform it's one of the things that community media can do uh, really effectively uh, plus we've also seen the rise if you like of alternative communities and the, uh, communities of interest uh, which build up around these things and the identification with things i don't know cosplay or fanzines or uh, um you kind of uh, music does this and street art does this and fashion does this. Um, but this idea of a kind of sense of personal expression uh, is part of the way that we build a sense of sociality. We build a sense of community because we're able to open up the repertoire of expressive uh, forms that in some way identify we identify with and that we're happy to share um that we become part of a community because of our interest not just in uh watching and passively receiving culture but from constructing our culture for being active playing an active role in our culture uh, so it's a personal expression that builds a sense of community through practice through doing rather than just something that is received. Some of the challenges, though, that face community models are things like um, gentrification. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, inequality, sorry. And uh, there's the idea of uh, the way that we think about our communities as places. And we've seen you know, some of the pressures over the last decade or so uh, 
are seeing you know the the property development model uh is you know speculation investor led first and community second and this is something that's happening around the world is that traditional you know kind of uh indigenous communities within a particular area often get pushed out because the money and investment that comes in brings in new people new forms of housing uh new forms of uh business premises uh new forms of transport and what you get is kind of a push away so the kind of the the established communities can often be pushed out of a particular location and we see this you know kind of <clears throat> to put it in extreme forms you know the kind of the um the 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 lack of investment in local neighborhoods based around certain areas of housing uh, and the property development speculation in terms of inward investment that many cities now have to uh, ha have to do in order to pay their bills and to provide their services selling off public you know kind of building tower blocks and uh, um, uh, cheaper accommodation but that brings with it then a shift in changing the culture and the, the coffee shop is often uh, regarded as the as as one of the kind of you know the uh, the, uh, the the lines if you like uh, the 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 fault lines in which these debates and discussions are expressed and the kind of hipsters and the you know the the the, the you get the, the the wealthier people moving into a deprived area which pushes out the uh, established communities who are poorer and 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 have less social capital so gentrification uh and and again it's there's there's both a positive and a negative benefit of gentrification social progress and social change does happen you can't really stop it uh but what you've got to ask is you know for whose benefit is the process of change being uh uh enacted and who has a say about what and where it takes place and at what what rate it takes place and who pays for it obviously is a crucial uh, uh distinct distinction uh so you know gentrification for many people is an attractive prospect because it opens up their life chances um and it opens up the possibilities of them having a a, a life which is richer and fuller and has more uh, cultural opportunities within there but for some people it it destroys those life chances and it takes away those traditional um communities those those traditional links that people had and that were established over a long period of time uh so it's 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 pulls in both directions it's it's a, it's very paradoxical but i suppose there's you know, this is where the 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 you know does community media have the capability of being part of the discussion about urban change and particularly as we think in terms of relation to climate crisis you know what is our community media able to do to contribute towards facilitating positive social change in these circumstances uh whether that's i mean i'm, I'm looking at this case as just an urban uh, uh, urban change but it might equally apply to rural communities as well um you know it's like what what is it we're asking um for people to engage with and to be open to uh and without discussion that brings people along and i think this is one of the crucial remits and the ideas for community media is that you can't manage social change you, social change is going to happen but you can't manage it if you don't include people in the conversations about it if you don't have a robust deliberative platforms for civic engagement people acting as citizens who are responsible and accountable for the community of and the location and the neighborhood from of, of which they uh, belong and want to feel as if they're part of and i'm not saying that anybody has a veto on change and no one group should be allowed to override the interests of another group but that's part of the civic liberal democracy is that we have a range of interests you know to some extent at the moment property development overrides an awful lot of um the interests of local communities to to sustain themselves so people kind of give up and don't engage in the political process 
But if we had community media platforms discussing these issues and discussing people's experiences on a regular basis, would we feel differently about it? Would we think differently about it? Um, because the alternative is to, you know, to push down the kind of social media influencers uh, model where you get these kind of obscene, uh, well, I, I, I believe they're obscene, um, you know, kind of gestures and displays of wealth that is kind of, uh, you know, it's often mocked, but, you know, it's kind of, it's it often fuels people's sense of, you know, it's like you might live in, a, 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 a shithole but you can afford to drive around in a rented uh you know high class sports car um because you're engaged in uh uh probably illegal activities you know it's like it's it's you know it does that add anything that ask the ultimate aspirational consumer society does it add anything to our sense of community because it doesn't put seem to me it doesn't seem to put anything back uh, which could be regarded as being part of the common good. It's just purely about selfish, indulgent um, uh, consumption, which, if you like, mocks people who are not uh, able to engage in that kind, in any kind of uh, um, affluent-based uh, uh, social consumerism. Uh, and we've become a society which is, you know, it's kind of it's, it's absurd. Uh, that these things get, you know, kind of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, positioned in the hierarchy of social values as being something which is of, you know, we we should we should aspire to, and I think you know there's another set of criteria that we need to consider uh, before uh, we 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 kind of celebrate this uh, this this kind of open ended uh, selfishness. Um, because it, 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 it destabilizes a sense of community and, you know, we're, we're only as strong as the, the weakest link in the social change, a chain, uh, you know, not everybody can play a, a, a strong role in, in society and in communities. Um, we all have um, a role to play, uh, but that might not be something which is uh, as active as maybe other uh, members of our community uh, and it you know we might need more time we we all at some point will need some additional support and some understanding from our, our fellow citizens that we can't play an active role uh, through health through uh, uh, mental health uh, through economic uh, changes through uh, you know we we have to accommodate uh, other people who are not as strong as we are ourselves uh, because if we don't accommodate that when we need support and help it might not be there for us either uh, so I'm, you know it's kind of this idea of community is based around mutual support and mutually engaging one another in order to bring about a a sustainable society something which is uh, manages its resource as well something which is uh, supportive of all contributors uh, which you know which which offers opportunities to those who wish to take them not at the expense of others but as part of a a, um, a mutual uh, world and I think you know things like the the pandemic and the climate crisis, are demonstrating that we need collective solutions to many of these problems. And this is where our media is, I think is lacking because it's so individuated, it's so privatized, it's become so disassociated from the day-to-day -day life of communities that it's become absurd. Uh, you know, and I know mean, it's vastly entertaining. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, I like watching stuff on Netflix and I like watching stuff on YouTube. But how grounded it, is it in in the life of my community and my experience, or your community and your experience? Uh, and if all we get is the kind of uh, the mass-produced convenience-based media, then we're not interacting with one another, and and we're not looking after our neighbours. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so the other element with this is is we become one of the strong elements about community media is that we're not just doing this because we want to serve the needs of our 
neighborhood and the people who we share our community with but we are a community in ourselves and a, a, what's called a community of practice so when you bring people together to make a radio station or run a magazine or put on an art exhibition or you know kind of run a facebook page as a group what you're doing is you're articulating a sense of community as a sense of practice through doing so it's you're not just doing it for itself um but what you're doing is you're adding meaning by um uh, undertaking this work and as a group of people who are undertaking this work you get some benefit from that you become something in the process and through the informal learning and mutual engagement um uh, model of communities of practice you become something uh, else you know mentioned this before but it's the um uh oh why have i forgotten his name uh it's it's not what you it's not what you get it's what you become i'll remember who that was in a moment um but you know it's that model it's that idea that by coming together to do something we are enriched and it's we are socially enriched but we are a community of practitioners uh who come together to make uh, make our media and so this the model of communities of practice is that you know it's this this cycle of identifying a theme or a purpose building content and material and activities that enable that and this generates a, a greater sense of trust and it generates a greater sense of knowledge that is shared between people so that you get a stronger sense of shared practice and this creates a sense of collective intelligence and it utilizes though the knowledge which comes from um, diverse groups some of it implicitly held some of it explicitly held and you know it's it's a cycle it's a development cycle and it, it kind of hopefully the community of engaged practitioners media makers uh, is how I like to community media makers uh, is how I like to think about it gain something in the process and you gain a sense of purpose which you again is added to and developed each time that you do something and you grow uh, as a person and you grow as a community and you grow as a group um, because you're learning and developing a sense of competence and understanding through doing um, so this is community media then uh, is is part of a, a a way of thinking which is about social learning uh, and I, I I kind of really want to explore this in more in, in a practice based way through things like YouTube uh, through things like online uh, uh, digital media engagement because uh, this social learning model is something which is um, to you know it's it's we 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 practice social learning, but we don't value social learning. Um, and we need, and social learning is an essential thing um, where we learn from one another, uh, both implicitly and tacitly, whereas formal learning can be quite exclusive and it's become an industrial machine and a process whereby people secure and maintain their personal advantage. Whereas a social learning system requires a different kind of thinking and it requires a a thinking around uh uh and the idea of uh, different modes of belonging which is what we've talked about uh, up to now so communities of practice communities of place identities uh, but very much shaped by our participation and very much shaped by what we do and what we engage with uh with the civic purpose of greater social understanding in mind um so we will be um you know kind of moving i think um generally towards more social learning models and we have to start to anticipate things like uh, uh post-institutional learning so uh, colleges universities schools will become less focused on institutionalized structures of learning and more open to social learning models um and we will start to i, I listen to more podcasts and watch youtube uh than, and i've learned more 
from that than I ever would if I, you know, if if I had to advise somebody, do you want to go to university? I'd say, well, you know, kind of maybe you can just do it on YouTube these days, and that's a very powerful position to be in. We have an alternative where you can be part of a global learning community, um, which is brought together through commonalities of interest and common interests in practice. Um, and, and so that social learning dynamic is, is going to be really important to explore in the future, uh, and, and to, to consider and to, to reflect on because everybody can contribute. And I think one of the, you know, we were talking earlier about the idea of integrated communities is, you know, kind of intergenerational intercommunity learning practices have kind of almost been, uh, 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 pushed out of our formal learning systems, whereas that, you know, kind of the model of shared learning um, with people of different ages, different capabilities, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, different social identities, different economic backgrounds, you know, we we kind of push people to think separately, whereas the, the learning will take place, the, the most effective learning it will take take place when we bring people together. But in order to do that, we have to you know, be kind to ourselves and our colleagues uh, because we have to be able to listen to each other's experiences in order to be able to grow and move forward and to produce and develop skills and capabilities and values which are fit for the the future uh but which are grounded on the lessons that have been taught us from the past um so that's that's that developmental model and you know the kind of developmental idea of uh we move through stages uh and that we are uh, incre incre increasing our capability because we are reflexive. Uh, so commun can community media play a role in that is a good question. And can community media, you know, it's like if, you, if, you, if you're if you an education authority, a college, an adult education group, and you haven't got your own radio program uh, or your own video channel, uh, you, you know, you're kind of missing out uh, because you can get to people directly while they're doing other things. Uh, in, in order to bring people together, you know, learning doesn't just stay in the classroom, uh, but it extends out to all parts of our uh, society. And if we can have radio stations and uh, community groups using media in order to facilitate and share their learning in a social sense, then that adds to the flow of um, ideas. Uh, and that they helps to promote a positive sense of understanding about one another and learning from each other. Uh, so that kind of, you know, can we use our community media as a learning tool? It's always a question that I, uh, you know, there's only one question you need to ask about any kind of educational endeavor, any kind of educational endeavor. Is anybody learning anything? And if you can't answer that, if you can't say directly what it is that people are learning, then you're an, an administrator. You're not a teacher. And that kind of, you know, do we employ people within our community media groups, our community radio stations as teachers? Yes, you use media, but what you're doing is you're using it as a, a, a platform for learning. And are people who listen to your programs, who engage with your content, who read your articles, are they learning anything? And that's really important to say that, you know, this is a platform which is outside of the commercial press pressures of transaction uh, and and you know corporate profit making and the social purpose maybe of community media uh, is that it encourages learning and development um, we've talked about social development and community development previously maybe we need to be thinking more about learning development as well as a, as part of this process so you know kind of the the the, the you know we we should be watching what it is that people do talk about interact with how in which people think about these things whether it's uh, performance based thinking whether it's an analytic based thinking you know there's a huge range of different ways that we learn um, and we don't all learn in a straight line and we learn at different 
ways at different times we have different priorities so keeping the process open as much as possible is really important and we you know the technology is shifting and changing for us to do this we can listen to podcasts uh, we can listen to, we can watch youtube uh, videos there's a whole range of different types of um uh, models of thinking and learning that social learning models can can point us towards uh, so, so you know, what is our, our role? Well, it's 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 the role is to be uh, community organisers uh, who are want to see the uh, you know a change in the life of of a particular community. Uh, does that come from within, or can that be structured and organised externally? Um, so you know, kind of maybe we we kind of you know. We don't have an, a specific agenda about that, um, and that we're not trying to, you know, kind of shape people into doing things, mould people into doing things that they don't wish to do. But I think it's we we have a responsibility to ask the question, you know, how how can we improve our social experience? um and what will improve our social experience and how can we do that ourselves um so you get that kind of mutual support and mutual um benefit that comes from people coming together to share experience and to learn from their experiences so you can't say to people specifically what it is that you're going to do and how you're going to do it uh, and you have to be creative and imaginative, but there is a process there that if we understand what the dynamic of the process is, then we can get a stronger sense of how it might work. Uh, and yeah, we might not get the outcomes that we expect, but we might get more than we bargained for than if we did nothing or if we just followed the well-established path of, of kind of thinking formally and uh, uh, modeling things in a kind of management way. So this brings us back to, you know, this notion of of understanding what the community means. And there's a really good toolkit on the UNESCO website, um, which is the link is is in the notes, uh, which says, you know, kind of it's it's it maps this out, and it asks it's a good a good activity to undertake in terms of looking at and thinking about what the you know what your use of the phrase the community. I always like that the community. If somebody uses that phrase hone in on that because there's a lack of understanding and i think the answer uh in my experience is to say who are the people that you're referring to so when somebody says the community we're doing this for the community you have to ask and say tell us who those people are we need to know because people are identified as communities in many different ways and using many different if you like social characteristics uh, and we don't just have to bring people together on the basis of those uh, inherited social characteristics. Many people do not want to be primarily identified by their 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 their, their historical cultural legacy, if you like, legacies, if you like. Uh, and some people, you know, kind of want to engage with others by celebrating those cultural legacies. Um, but there are times when you know, you 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 find strength uh, in, in in being part of a, a recognised, identified community, and when you find strength in being separate from that community, uh, because you get insight by understanding the dynamic between the two, uh, not merely saying and labelling people as only as members of that community, because nobody is only a member of one specific particular community and over identification with one specific uh, tightly defined community can be really problematic in terms of the, the wider common good. Um, so I suppose the question is how can we use community media to galvanize a sense of social uh, solidarity and coherence and uh, a cohesive community and uh, you know, the local authorities around the country here in the UK have have tried marketing strategies and plans to uh, to to develop a sense of this, and 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 what they've come up with is often you know kind of found to be inadequate. Is that you can't really just project an identity onto a group of people; you have to approach this in a different way. 
And one of the things that came out of the pandemic was the um, a really excellent uh, We Are Leicester uh, video, which talked about when we were at that uh, key moment when the uh, we were in our extended lockdown, and it felt we were a bit, you know, everybody else around the country was kind of coming out of their lockdown, but we felt a bit embattled here in the city. But and a good response to this was, and I think it's a it's, it's a form of creative community media that is very well. There's lessons to be drawn from it. Is this. A video that was created and shared on social media called We Are Leicester. We are Leicester. We are Leicester. We are Leicester. We are a city of solidarity. When we locked down in March, we didn't know what to expect, but we knew that our lives would become more difficult. But we also knew that if we cooperated, we could help our neighbours get through this. So together, we helped each other in big ways or small. Community centres. Religious organisations. Sports teams. Mutual aid groups. Shops and pubs. And our mates. Together, we donated, we shielded. We did shopping, we delivered food parcels, we reassured the lonely. We wove a safety net, which helped thousands of people who'd have fallen through the cracks otherwise. We helped strangers without stopping to ask where they were from. And others helped us. We witnessed moments of amazing generosity between neighbours. Now we've got to go through this all again, but this time on our own, as a city. But we know we can make it. We can look after each other and help each other through this time. Because we are a city of solidarity. We are Leicester. We are Leicester. We are Leicester. A really powerful. Um, we are Leicester. We are Sorry, a really powerful, evocative um, idea of a sense of mutual support and community. I think is you know community isn't defined by what you are. It really should be defined by what you do, uh, and how you support others within your community, and how you develop a greater sense of mutual support and understanding. Uh, so how we you know what ensures that we have a knowable sense of community isn't fixed and that we can be creative about this but what i'd suggest and argue for is that you know at the heart of a sense of community is a kind of sense of learning learning about one another learning about each other's experience and hopefully out of that learning comes a sense of respect and a sense of identification that our community functions and plays a positive role in our lives um and we might kind of ask some questions that we want to take forward and and think about how we can use our media in order to promote a stronger sense of community and that you know what are we concerned with and and what are we concerned in in in, in uh th those points positive and negative in developing a wider social um understanding of uh, you know, what's the best format then to express those ideas and those concerns and those experiences? Uh, not every format, uh, you know, is 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 the same as another. You might want to write about it in a blog or make a contribution to a newsletter or uh, record a video or use uh, Zoom to talk with people on the, you know, in public meetings and discussion, private meetings and discussions or to make a radio program, a vast, vast range of different types of content that you can do, use. Uh, and, and what will be different from mainstream forms of media in the way that you bring people together? Um, what is it that will be the glue that cements people to feel like they can participate and and take part in a sense of community? Um, and and what would be different in the way that you express your sense of identity? Um, uh, and 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 how is that mutually supported and recognised in the wider um, community that your sense of identity? is as legitimate as other people's sense of ident identity uh, and that you you can just express yourself for who you are, I suppose. So uh, references there, let's stop the share. So uh, a, a good um, lot of stuff to be thinking about there. As I say, this is kind of developmental thinking in my mind. I'm not quite um, uh, fixed in my views and I would really appreciate having 
uh, some feedback and some conversation and discussion about this, which we can do in the Decentered Media Forum. And as the MOOC has developed, we'll have opportunities to share other content and information as well. Um, I hope this gives a good overview. The notes will be available with the video as well. Uh, and we'll follow some of these topics up and develop them in future as, as, as we go through and our, our minds are uh, 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 you know, kind of uh, inspired to, uh, to, to further engage with these kind of conversations. But for now, thanks very much and we'll speak to you soon. You've been watching a Decentered Media Talk with me, Rob Watson. To find out more, go to decentered.co.uk or follow on Twitter and Instagram at Decentered Media.